Right, so uh, I'm from Utrecht and uh, also since uh, uh, one and a half years, one day per week in Eindhoven, uh, which um, from the uh, microscopic scale are kind of very close together. Um, so I'll be talking about spintronics with uh, magnetic insulators. Um, now just to get everybody on the same page, I want to give a, a very basic introduction to uh, magnetism, magnetic insulators, and then to spin currents, and then towards the end of the talk I'll mention a couple of uh, uh, more recent, let's say more advanced uh, um, works. So first of all, magnetism is one of the oldest uh, uh, physical phenomena that we know. Uh, so this is an old, it also has, its, it has applications already for many centuries. So this is an old, uh, very old compass, I think. Uh, this is a book about how magnetism uh, was used in the uh, 1800s to cure people. Um, but it, I think it doesn't really work, but uh, nonetheless, <laughs> at least not uh, uh, in the way they used it back then. But nonetheless, magnetism has been around uh, and, and uh, has been known for several centuries. And only, let's say, 100 years ago, it's been understood to some extent what it's about uh, uh, microscopically. So here's a um, kind of a slide which introduces various concepts that are perhaps important for uh, the remainder of my talk. So, so if I take a macroscopic magnet and zoom in, uh, what you'll find is you'll find mesoscopic domains. So mesoscopic domains of magnetization pointing in some random direction. Uh, and these, uh, these are of size, let's say, typical, typically micrometers. So these magnetic domains here are of the order of micrometers. And then if you zoom in further, then you'll find that the mag magnetism actually caused microscopically by uh, spins, let's say of electrons or of, uh, of atoms, uh, that are aligned within these domains. And then a transition between such a domain, uh, you call a domain wall. Okay? Now, um, so a microscopic magnet can be magnetized by applying a magnetic field uh, to this randomly ordered, ordered state of magnetic domains. And then you microscopically magnetize the sample. So this is kind of phenomenologically what a magnet uh, looks like. And then uh, at the level of some energy or Hamiltonian, there are basically a couple of three important uh, energy scales that you, sh you should worry about when you describe magnetism. So the first of these is the exchange. So exchange is the interaction that uh, quantum mechanical in nature that forces the magnetic moments, so these spins within the magnetic domains to align. And it's typically a huge energy scale. So for a magnetic, a typical ferromagnet uh, like iron, it can be of the order of a thousand uh, uh, when you convert it to, a, to magnetic fields of the order of a thousand Tesla. And it also sets the critical temperature for the magnetism. So that's, that's kind of what, uh, what, this, what this energy scale does. So it wants to align different magnetic moments within one magnetic domain. Secondly, there are anisotropies. So these are uh, um, uh, terms in the Hamiltonian uh, that give preferential directions for the magnetization. For example, to point along uh, the lattice uh, um, principal axis, et cetera, in the solid states. Uh, so these are, well, this is an example of an anisotropy with some constant k. And typically, this constant k is three orders of magnitude smaller than uh, the exchange constant here. So that's why these, these mesoscopic domains are as large as they are. And then finally, that if you have an external field, there will be a coupling of the, mag the magnetism to the external field. So this is uh, an interaction term that corresponds to the external, external field in the z direction. Uh, now, just a hierarchy of energy scales, I already pointed out that this anisotropy is roughly, uh, roughly speaking three orders of magnitude smaller than the exchange. And the magnetic field is of the same order of the anisotropy. Now, what this means physically is that uh, whenever I have a magnet, and whenever I bring it into a, uh, let's say, a single domain state by magnetizing it, then I can easily, with an external magnetic field, realign the direction of magnetization because the external field is able to, comp to compete with the anisotropy. But I can never ever, with an external field, uh, for example, destroy the magnetism. So because the external field is never ever, uh, never ever able to compete with the exchange interaction. Okay, so the exchange interaction holds all the magnetic moments together. And an external field can realign these moments. Um, but the external field cannot compete with the exchange interaction. So that's roughly speaking the, the hierarchy of energy scales and magnets. Uh, 
Now, such a domain will, uh, in this particular example, so in this particular example, let's say there are two preferential directions for uh, magnetization, let's say up and down. So given by this energy scale here is anisotropy, and then a typical domain will width um, will be of the order of the exchange interaction divided by the anisotropy. So exchange wants domain walls to be very, very large. Anisotropy wants them to be small, and that sets this, this uh, width of the domain wall to be on the order of a micrometer to a nanometer. Okay? So this is kind of magnetostatic, say. Um, now, what's also important for my talk, most of the time I'll be talking about dynamics of magnetization. So that's described by a very, uh, let's say, old and famous equation in this field. It's called, in the field of magnetism, called the Lando Lisi's Gilbert equation. So this equation applies when we're at very, very low temperatures, uh, but low temperatures for magnetic metals like iron means basically room temperature already, because the critical temperature is very, very large, around 1,000 uh, Kelvin or so. Um, so at these low temperatures, the fluctuations of the magnitude of magnetization are not important anymore. All you care about is the direction of magnetization, uh, labeled by a unit vector that I'll call m. Now then the equation of motion for the magnetization is basically an equation of motion that describes precession of the magnetization. So that's this first term here. So this is precession of the magnetization around what people call an effective field. So if I have an external field, this effective field will actually be the, will be the external field. And then there's a damping of this uh, um, motion of the magnetization, and this damping forces in the long run the magnetization to point along the effective field. Now the typical time scales for this dynamics is around, uh, let's say, nanoseconds. So it takes about a nanosecond if I reorient a magnet with an external field takes about a nanosecond to, uh, for, the man, uh, for the magnet to uh, reorient itself. Now, just to give you some uh, idea of what dynamics would look like, um, I have here a little movie of magnetization dynamics, which is uh, basically fun to watch. So whenever I have a magnetic field misaligned with the direction of magnetization, there will be a torque on the magnetization causing it to process, as you see here. Uh, and this is then a single domain of magnetization. Now, in a, in a magnetic system, you would have little magnetic moment spins on every side of the lattice, and this is how it looks like, at least in a cartoon way, when they process all in phase. But of course, they can also process out of phase, such as in this cartoon here, uh, and then the, the motion of the magnetization is called the spin wave. Okay? Now, why the maker of this cartoon did this exactly, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but it just looks uh, like fun, I think. <laughs> so these spin waves, I will come back to that uh, in a few slides. So th those, are, those will be kind of the main objects uh, in my talk and how we can use them to transport, uh, 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 to, to transport spin currents. Now, until, let's say, more than a decade, one and a half decades ago, um, Whenever you wanted to manipulate a magnet, which is, of course, extremely important from the point of view of applications, so many of, let's say, application electronics, memory storage are based on reorienting uh, magnets to write these, uh, uh, to write a magnetic memory. What you would do is you would take a magnet and then reorient it, for example, by applying an external field induced by, uh, uh, by a current, such as in this cartoon, a coil here. Um, now, the natural question now to ask if, is if, if, if this is the only way to manipulate a magnetization direction. And of course, the answer is no. Um, and most of my talk will be about giving some examples of, of manipulating magnetism, of interacting with magnetism in ways that are different from applying an external field. So I'll be talking about the interaction of electronic spin currents with magnetization dynamics. And uh, there have already been many examples of this in the last decade as well. Uh, and the, the example on which I'll focus is how to use the interaction between electronic spin current and magnetization dynamics to uh, send a spin current through a magnetic insulator. So a magnetic insulator meaning that it's a, uh, a material that does not conduct, conduct electronic charge, but it does conduct spin current in the form of uh, these spin waves that were shown in this, in this movie. Just before. So I'll go through an experiment uh, which is 
the first of its kind to show this. And I'll give you a little bit of the theory. And this, this I'll try to take as, as easy as possible, so to say. And then uh, after that, I'll, I'll, I'll show you some more recent work. Um, and it could be that I have to skip one of these. Uh, um, but then again, I just want to give you some flavor of recent work that we did based on these uh, insights. Um, and by the way, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to uh, answer them tr during the talk rather than uh, at the end. Now, before going on, uh, let me just acknowledge my collaborators. So the, the, there are several people from uh, Utrecht involved in this work. I'll talk about an experiment being done in the, that has been done in the group of Bart van Wees in Groningen. And we had some theory collaborations, mostly with uh, Garrett Bauer, um, and also with people from, from Chile and, uh, uh, and the group of Arne Bratas in Trondheim. So let me first introduce uh, electronic spin currents, again, to get everybody on the same page. Um, so here's an example, okay, this is, this is all very cartoonesque, uh, but this is an example of a, a charge current without any spin current. So if I have an electron moving on average in one direction, this electron will be made up of, uh, let's say, spin up and spin down. But if they both move in the same fashion, just which would happen in an ordinary conductor, such as uh, a copper or so, then the, the total charge current would be non-zero, but the total spin current, which I define uh, for reasons of simplicity as being the difference between the charge current carried by up electrons and down electrons would, be, would also be zero. Now this changes when I'm dealing with a magnetic metal. So when I'm dealing with a magnetic metal, there are, uh, this is a system that's magnetic but also electrically conducting. Then uh, whenever I drive a charge current by applying a voltage, uh, there's an asymmetry between spin up and down electrons just because of the uh, magnetization itself. So this means that there are, let's say, more up than down electrons. And also they scatter differently. So this in general, in general means that the, uh, there's a non-zero charge current, but also a non-zero spin current just because the up and down uh, channels are different. Now this is the situation that happens in magnetic uh, metals. Now the situation that I want to explain in a little bit more detail is, uh, is the following situation. If you, if you manage to um, uh, set, let's say, the spin up and down electrons in uh, motion in different directions, then the net charge current will be, non, uh, will, will be zero, but the spin current, the difference between these two charge currents will be zero, a uh, non-zero. And this is a situation that happens in the spin hall effect uh, that I sketch here. So the spin hall effect, I think, some of you, uh, perhaps most of you, will, be, will have heard about this before. So the spin hole effect is not going to be a topic of my talk in the sense that I'm not going to explain this in detail. So the spin hole effect, for the purpose of my talk, is a tool to uh, basically get spin currents, so to inject them. And the inverse of the spin hole effect, uh, named the inverse spin hole effect for uh, reasons of lack of fantasy, um, is going to be a tool to detect spin currents. Okay, so here are two cartoons to, uh, that describe the spin hole effect and its inverse. So the spin hole effect is a situation where you drive a charge current, uh, and where the, let's say, up and down electrons that make up the char this charge current scatter uh, differently um, uh, between so-called spin orbit coupled impurities, and then predominantly the, let's say, down electrons are scattered one way, s sideways, and the up electrons are scattered the other way. And this leads then to a spin current uh, transverse to the applied charge current. Okay? So the microscopic mechanism for this is uh, uh, um, uh, rather complicated, but ultimately it's always rooted in spin orbit coupling in one way or another. So it can be uh, spin dependent spin orbit coupling of the electrons with uh, uh, um, uh, little magnetic impurities or so. Can be can be anything. Um, but so th th that's what I'm not going to go into detail about. Um, now, the, the material in which the spin hole effect is, is uh, known to be rather large is, is the, is the non-magnetic metal platinum. So most of the experimental setups that I'm going to show, uh, the uh, non-magnetic metal of interest will be platinum. And that will be kind of the source of spin current and the detector of the spin current. Now, what is very important uh, that the spin hole effect 
it leads to a spin current. So uh, let's say a charge current in this direction leads to a transverse spin current. If this spin current then, let's say, is uh, stopped by, um, uh, for example, the material ending in vacuum or with an interface, uh, by an interface with another material, there will be a non-zero chemical potential for spin, that what we call spin accumulation, being set up at this, uh, at this interface. So the spin hole effect, what's important for my presentation, that the spin hole effect basically establishes a non-zero chemical potential for spin at an interface with another material. Now the inverse of the spin hole effect is whenever you have a spin current, uh, via the inverse of this process, it will lead to a transverse charge current. So whenever I inject a spin current into a material uh, which has this, uh, which has a large spin orbit coupling, which therefore has this inverse spin hole effect, I will be able to detect the spin current as a transverse vo voltage. So a voltage that's transverse, at least in the case of an open circuit, transverse to the uh, direction in which I inject the spin current. So again, I'm not going to say too much about the spin hole effect. Uh, this has been kind of uh, uh, an often studied topic. So for me, this will, this will be kind of just a source of spin current and a uh, detection mechanism of spin current. Go ahead. So um, spin, the conservation of spin current is not as simple as that of charge. So yeah, so this is one of the things I'm not going to go in. <laughs> okay, yeah, so this is no, it, it bothers me every time spin current comes up. Now, um, so, so the answer to that is, of course, uh, yes, it's not as, uh, so it, let's say this, this has been a, an issue in, in computing, uh, let's say spin hole conductivity, et cetera. The definition, the problem with the definition, if the, unless yeah. you assume the spin orbit coupling is of a specific kind. Yeah, so, so in my talk, this doesn't play too much of a role in the sense that uh, I'm going to talk mostly about spin currents through insulators. And these spin currents are, are rather well defined. Now these spin currents that I'm going to talk about, I'm, I'm kind of giving now a summary of my talk, but uh, the reason why this doesn't play a role is that uh, these spin currents are injected and detected by, uh, let's say, platinum strips on the side. Now, um, whatever uh, I'm going to talk about, you can, ultimately you don't have to worry too much about the definition of spin current, because you can effectively replace uh, um, um, whatever goes on at the interface as some effective coupling between the electron spins and the magnetization and the detection me mechanism likewise. So ultimately the microscopic mechanism and, and the spin hole, uh, things like the spin hole effect, ultimately you can get rid of them if you want to. So, so for the insulator, the magnetic insulator is actually too invariant, so, so spin, spin, is, spin is conserved? Right, right, to a, to a good approximation. There are some, I will talk in detail about uh, damping mechanisms and so on. But, uh, so basically, the, the, the short answer to your question is, so this is kind of a convenient way to think about what goes on in the metals, but if you don't want to, you don't have to rely on this picture. That's kind of the, but it's just, it's, it's, it's convenient. Okay, so having introduced at least these spin currents and how to get them and how to detect them in the normal metals, I will now uh, go to an experiment that I want to describe in some detail. Um, which is a non-local transport experiment on the magnetic insulator uh, yttrium iron garnet called YIG. So this, this is an often used magnetic insulator in this business just because its uh, relaxation is very, very small. So it has the lowest uh, Gilbert damping, so the lowest, so the highest magnetic quality factor of all the uh, magnetic materials that are known. And so the experiment is as follows. So what you see here is, uh, so all this black stuff is basically this uh, a top view of, of a, a film of yttrium iron garnet. And then on top of this, uh, uh, this film, so this, there's no, actually the scale bar has kind of uh, disappeared, I see, but this is roughly, let's say, micrometers, so hundreds of micrometers or tens of micrometers, so it's a relatively big sample. Um, so on top of this magnetic insulator, two platinum strips are deposited, so that's these, these lines here, so these long strips. And then through one of these uh, platinum strips, so they're deposited on top of the magnetic insulator. Through one of these platinum strips, a uh, charge current is sent, and then a voltage is detected in the adjacent uh, platinum strip. Um, but there's no, let's say, direct electrical contact between these two platinum strips. So this defines, uh, 
So such a measurement in general that would define a non-local resistance being the voltage measured in one strip divided by the current to the other strip. So these are kind of non-local voltages that have also been measured in the context of, say, uh, multi-probe setups on graphene. Let me finish the sentence. Uh, or, for example, in, in two uh, um, in bilayers of semiconductors. Go ahead. Between this and a transformer. A transformer has mostly to do with uh, with AC, I believe. Uh, so this is a, a DC. This is a DC uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I'm lying a little bit in the sense that this is an AC measurement, just to be able to no, to, to extract DC, certain effects. Yeah. So this is uh, yeah. This doesn't have anything to do with induction of one wire to the other. So yeah. Thanks for asking that because uh, now. Um, Right, so, 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 so this is defines this, this non-local resistance uh, as being uh, the voltage in one wire divided over the current in the other wire. Now this, this non-local resistance or this voltage is then measured um, as a function of a direction of magnetic field with, let's say, the, uh, um, uh, the normal of, the, of, of these platinum wires. So this defines then an angle alpha. Now, in this magnetic material, so YIG is a very soft magnetic material. This means that the external field, as long as, as it's above, let's say, a few uh, tens of milliteslas, basically the magnetization instantaneously follows the magnetic field. Now, what you see here is then this non-local voltage as a function of this, this angle alpha. And basically, this plot tells you that uh, whatever uh, mediates the... Uh, um, let's say that whatever communicates the current in this uh, um, platinum strip with, with the uh, electrons in the, in the other platinum strip has to do something with the magnetism. Now this plot uh, um, is a little bit hard to understand. I, I, if there are questions, I can come back to it, but I think that the, the take home message is that this is something that has to do with the uh, um, magnetism. Now, one other thing that is kind of interesting, this is all at room temperature. So this is, doesn't uh, involve any uh, low temperature uh, physics whatsoever. Um, the reason why this can occur at, at these large temperatures, let me, let me come back to it, is that uh, YIG is a magnetic material which has a TC of around 500 kelvins. Go ahead. What's the scale, like scale um, Right, so this kind of answers that question. So this, <laughs> this measurement is now done for different let's say setups with different distances of these two platinum strips. And so they can be on the order of, let's say, uh, uh, tens of micrometers away from each other. That answers your question, I guess. Right. Now what is interesting now is that, uh, so this non-local voltage is now measured as a function of distance. And you see basically two regimes. One is a kind of diffusive regime where uh, the scaling is one over distance and at long length scales, you get an exponential decay that with a characteristic length scale of around 10 micrometers or so. And so this is a, uh, will turn out to be a, uh, correspond to a magnon spin diffusion length in this material uh, YIG. Okay, so how do we understand now this experiment? Um, so basically the, the kind of, let's say cartoon understanding of this experiment is as follows. So what happens here uh, is, is kind of sketched in this cartoon. So it, this is one platinum strip, this is the other platinum strip, and this is the uh, magnetic insulator in between. So what you're doing is basically sending in, sending a charge current to one of these platinum strips. But because of the spin hole effect, there'll be a transverse spin current set up. Now this transverse spin current, so that's kind of these electrons uh, reflecting, uh, uh, which spin up reflecting in one way and down in the other way. So this transverse spin current um, is converted into a spin current carried by magnetic fluctuations in the magnetic insulator. So that's, and these are called magnons, spin waves, uh, if you quantize them, called magnons. And they carry the spin, the spin current from one platinum strip to the other. And then at the other platinum strip, the reverse happens. So we have the inverse spin hole effect, meaning that the electron spin current is converted into a charge current and then is measured as a voltage in this open circuit. Okay, so the kind of conversion process is uh, electron charge current to spin current, to magnon spin current, to electron spin current, and back to charge current. So that's what gives this non-local voltage. Now what's very important, of course, is that the 
electron charge current is, is pushed basically tangential to the interface between the, uh, the non-magnetic metal platinum and the magnetic insulator. Because if I would try to directly push a charge current in this direction, it wouldn't work because this is actually a, uh, an insulator, electrically insulating system. However, the conduction from this to this is, is, is happening via the spin channel, via the uh, magnetic fluctuations. Okay, so this is what we call then, uh, let, let's say, magnon spintronics, is electrical control over these uh, um, spin, current spin currents carried by these magnetic fluctuations. And what I'll talk about a little bit later is that it also gives rise to some interesting many body physics and also to uh, spin currents with very low dissipation. So this, this, um, this spin diffusion length, this characteristic length scale of 10 micrometers um, is already, apart from graphene, the world record in a spin diffusion length in uh, a solid state material. So this is at room temperature, there was no optimization whatsoever and already the first experiment gives, uh, gives 10 micrometers, which in this context is a huge uh, length scale. Okay, let me now go through a little bit of theory um, as to how we explain this experiment in more detail. Um, so here's again uh, a little, uh, just for, um, because we're halfway through the talk and, and it's nice to look at a little movie, I think. <laughs> So here's again a, a reminder of, let's say, what's, what, what spin waves would look like in a classical system. So if I would have many spins coupled and set one of them into motion, I get these nice uh, spin waves. Um, let's see if there's also a happy ending in this. No, okay, this, this just ends. Um, now, quantum mechanically, you would have to quantize these spin waves to uh, set up a proper theory. And this is done with the uh, so-called Holstein-Primakov transformation. This is well known in the, in the, in the context of, of magnetic materials, magnetic systems. So the Holstein-Primakov transformation basically allows you to replace a, a spin operator. So this is particularly the spin raising operator uh, expressed in terms of the uh, X and Y components in this way. It allows you to replace uh, the spin operators with uh, bosonic operators uh, using the, this set of transformations. Now this square root uh, is there because the Hilbert space of, uh, of a single spin is, uh, is, is, is finite dimensional, whereas the bosonic Fox space would be infinite dimensional, so this, this square root is there to cut it off. But for a small amount of spin waves, small amount of magnons in the linear regime, you can basically uh, expand the square root. Now what you then find is a mapping of spins to bosons, and these bosons basically carry one h-bar of angular momentum. So the, if these bosons move, so it's basically a flip spin moves throughout a, 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 through a magnetic insulator, then it transports one h-bar of angular momentum. And if I kind of rewrite the spin Hamiltonian using the holstein primakov transformation, I basically get a hopping Hamiltonian for bosons moving about in a lattice. So very much similar to, uh, 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 for the people who work on cold atoms, bosonic cold atoms, so very much similar to those kind of Hamiltonians, let's say Bose-Hubbard type Hamiltonians. Now, at the interface, so the, so the first question I'm going to ask is what happens at the interface? Uh, so at the interface, so I have a paramagnetic metal, a non-magnetic metal. I do, however, have a, uh, a spin current <coughs> set up by the spin hall effect in this non-magnetic metal. And then there's an interface with a magnetic insulator. So in this side of the system, the, uh, the magnons, there are spin fluctuations, but there is no electrons moving about. On this side of the uh, um, interface, there are electrons, but there's no magnetization. <coughs> and at the interface, there's a coupling between the spins of the electrons here and the spins uh, in the magnetic insulator. And this coupling would look something like this. So an interface exchange coupling of the spin in the magnetic insulator coupled to the spin at the, uh, um, in the normal metal at the interface. Now, if you write, write out this coupling in terms of second quantized operators for the electrons, so that's the C up and the C down, and for the magnons, it's the, uh, the A and the A dagger, what you basically find is that this coupling corresponds to a spin flip at the interface, and then the creation or destruction of one magnon or spin wave in the magnetic insulator. So what basically happens is actually described in this cartoon. So a, 
let's say spin uh, up electron comes in at the interface, impinges on the interface, can flip its spin, and so it gives away one h bar, uh, one h bar of angular momentum because an electron up has h bar over two, down minus h bar over two. So there's one h bar of angular momentum missing, and that's then absorbed by the magnetic insulator in the form of a spin wave or a magnum, if you uh, think about it quantum mechanically. So at the interface, you have such interactions between electrons and magnons. Now then, to set up a proper theory, I don't want to uh, go too much in detail about how we do this. Uh, uh, what we basically do is we consider systems like this, where we describe the normal metal basically as a bot for spin, so we don't regard the uh, spin hole effect in detail, we just say there is a chemical potential for spin being set up in the normal metal lead, which leads to a spin accumulation mu L, so it's a chemical uh, potential for spin mu L, and on the right lead there will be a chemical potential for, uh, for spin mu R, and in principle some temperature on left and right, and then at the interface there are these scattering processes which give rise to a magnum current as we can then calculate. Now what's very important to take into account, uh, and that's ultimately what's going to give this relaxation length scale, what's very important to take into account is that within the magnetic insulator there's a coupling to lattice vibrations, phonons, and this coupling doesn't have to conserve spin, and this will lead to a decay of spin current in the magnetic insulator. Okay, and these phonons can also have a temperature uh, that we call TP, the phonon temperature. So why, does, why do phonons flip the spin? Um, right, so if you have crystalline anisotropy, we give a crystalline anisotropy, then uh, if this crystalline anisotropy is changed by phonons, that, that, that process doesn't conserve spin. Yeah. So that's, uh, that, that's one way to think about it. Okay, go ahead. Is it, is it obvious from your argument that uh, spin orbit coupling or some form of spin hall like properties for the blue regions is important and just a regular metal won't work? Can you say that again? So would, a, would just some regular metal, like I don't know, aluminum or something, ah. would it work for, uh, for the blue region? Or is there a reason? From your argument, I don't see the reason. I, guess it seems I mean, the, the point is if you manage to, to, to establish a spin accumulation uh, at the interface of a, uh, so in the normal metal at the interface with a magnetic insulator, then the spin accumulation will, will drive spin into the magnetic insulator. Now the question is, how do I establish this uh, spin accumulation? So in this, ex in this you know, everything I've said, this is established with the spin hole effect. You can do this in, in different ways. Um, yeah, but uh, you see the point is it's kind of hard to do it. Uh, so, so in the, let's say, conventional spintronics, you would, uh, for example, have a spin valve set up, two magnets. I, I don't know how familiar you are with that, but... So well, let's say a nanomagnet, another nanomagnet, and you drive a current, and this current drags along spin, and then you establish uh, spin accumulation at an interface. But here you cannot do that because you're trying to push something into an insulator. So you cannot drive, you cannot drive charge current. So let's say, yeah. So basically you cannot drive the charge current in this direction. So that's why the spin hole effect is particularly useful here, because you have to drive the charge current tangential to the interface. I mean, there are, um, yeah, there are ways to do this without using the spin hole effect, uh, but they have not been demonstrated experimentally yet. Do you have a same one field of different magnitude on the two magnets? Um, so a Zeeman field is, does not necessarily drive uh, a spin current, because it, it basically it doesn't really act like a chemical potential. So if I have a, uh, a magnet and I have a fixed Zeeman field, you just establish some new equilibrium, but it, you don't, you're not really, they don't, it doesn't act like a grand canonical bot, so to say, so you don't extract or insert particles, really. So to, to do something with Zeeman fields, you would have to do it time dependent. Uh, so if you, if you manage to localize a magnetic field, let's say here and here, and do it in a time dependent way, such that the system doesn't reach an equilibrium, then you could uh, measure some AC spin current, perhaps. I mean, the nice thing, about uh, using the spin hole effect is that these metal leads really act like uh, like bots for spin, kind of a like grand canonical bot, say. Does that answer your question? Or? Yeah. So I don't think, yeah, I don't think a, 
a Zeeman field or a field gradient, at least a static one, would necessarily drive spin transport in a straightforward way. Plus that it's super hard to do experimentally, but... Uh, um, I'm confused where I was. Anyway, so th this is kind of the setup. Um, now let's say, so, so what we do theoretically is uh, there are various things to do. So one particular formalism that we use is uh, we use kind of a Keldish formalism to calculate the density matrix of the magnons, integrating out these electronic leads. And these electronic leads then give, uh, give rise to self energies uh, uh, for the magnons uh, living in this magnetic insulator. Okay, so here's again the typical Hamiltonian. So it's, as I said, it's a hopping Hamiltonian for, uh, for bosons, for spin waves, localized spin waves. An external field gives a gap on these, uh, on these uh, spin waves. And using this, you can basically set up a um, uh, kind of a theory to compute the density matrix for the magnets from which you can compute everything else. Now, one thing that's kind of important is that, uh, let's say, so the coupling to leads is described by these kind of self energies, which are ohmic, so they're linear in, uh, linear in energy of the magnons. And the prefactor of this linearity is a, a type of conductance that people call the mixing conductance. So, so that's what I call G up down here. And this will be proportional to the interface coupling squared within perturbation theory. Now, this interface mixing conductance is something that you can measure in a different type of experiment. So it's something that's typically known for uh, interfaces between normal metals and magnetic insulators or magnetic conductors even, because it basically characterizes the amount of enhancement of relaxation if you interface the, mag the magnet with something uh, non-magnetic. Non uh, non and then the Gilbert damping will also give a self-energy that's proportional to this damping constant alpha, which is also known uh, from uh, magnetic resonance experiments. So basically all the parameters that enter this theory effectively are known. Uh, and then if you go through a calculation, so this is what you predict. So here is now on the right, there is a, a theoretical prediction for, uh, uh, for this non-local experiment. So what you see here is uh, uh, a parameter called eta, which is the current in the left conductor uh, over the, uh, well, let's say one over this current uh, and then uh, times the current over the, in, in the right conductor. So this is the strength of this non-local effect as a function of the distance, and you find this exponential decay, and for short distances you find a one over a length scale type uh, decay. And this eta, the, the, the magnitude of this effect is basically proportional to this interface parameter which we know. So this, uh, uh, this order of magnitude is in, in agreement with experiments. And also the characteristic length scale you can compute from this Gilbert damping from th that you know for this magnetic material and then you find the right order of magnitude for this, uh, for this characteristic length scale, which is on the order of 10 micrometers. Okay? So the, bas the basic, uh, basic theory actually gives a rather good agreement, even quantitatively, uh, with the experiments. Now, so then the question is, what can we do uh, next? So we now have a situation where we have a magnetic insulator, so bosons that we can drive by connecting them to... Uh, normal metals, and I want to give, um, probably I'll restrict myself to two examples, um, uh, skipping the uh, multi insulator with we, whoever wants to discuss, I'm happy to discuss uh, uh, with. So we're now going to move to a situation where the magnetic insulator is, is uh, um, not as simple as YIG, so this, uh, this is basically is, is non-interacting magnons. Um, I'm still going to talk about non-interacting magnons, but now with a, with a more complicated single particle Hamiltonian. I'm going to discuss now the same type of, uh, well, not an experiment, but a theory for a similar setup where the system would be a topological magnon insulator. So this is, uh, with a topolo topological magnon insulator, I mean a electrical uh, insulator, so a magnetic, uh, uh, a magnetic system that's electrically insulating but on top of that, the magnons, the spin waves, uh, have a topological band structure. Uh, now, there are various proposals for doing this. Uh, so this is one Hamiltonian that we studied in detail. So rather than having, uh, and this Hamiltonian is defined on a honeycomb lattice here, uh, so, so graphene-like lattice. So in addition to having exchange and external field, there's also now a gielizinski moria interaction. So a gielizinski moria interaction is a chiral interaction, and it basically gives a, 
uh, a turning center. It would prefer a, um, the magnetic moments to rotate with respect to each other. Okay, so this term gives uh, an energetic, uh, favors energetically for neighboring magnetic moments to uh, rotate with respect to each other. And the exchange prevents that. Okay, so, the, so it's well known, or well known, it's, it's known that if you take this, this type of Hamiltonian and compute the spin wave spectrum that's shown here, uh, so this is spin wave frequency as a function of momentum. You get two bands. These bands are separated by a gap. Uh, and these bands have uh, uh, topological properties. So if you calculate their churn number, then uh, it's basically one and, and minus one, I think. Um, so, uh, so, the, so the spin waves have, have topological properties. So what does this mean? So this means if I t that I've, if I take a finite slab of such a system, then there will be currents through the bulk and currents along the edge carried by the magnons. Now, normally when you have an electronic topological insulator, um, you have a similar situation. However, if you transport charge to an uh, electronic topolog topological insulator, such as the quantum hole, the quantum hole system, then um, basically below the uh, gap, all the electronic states are filled up. And then uh, the transport is only by states in the gap, which are the edge states. So for electrons, for fermions in general, you're certain that uh, when you try to push a current to a topological system, it's only carried by the edge states. However, here we're dealing with magnons, which are bosons. And uh, basically then we have to worry about the relative contribution of the edge versus the bulk state. So this is not, it's not that the Pauli exclusion principle takes care of that automatically. So we really have to compute their relative contribution. So what we're going to consider is this, is this setup. So a magnetic insulator with uh, uh, topological magnon states and then connected to two normal metal leads. And I'm going to ask the question, so what is now the relative contribution of edge and bulk states? Okay. So this is something, a calculation that was carried out using the similar type of formalism as I uh, discussed before by Andreas Rückriegel, and basically what he finds is the following. So here's the situation. So we have an edge spin current and a bulk spin current. And here we have then the spin current as a function of the size of the system L. Okay? And so what you find is there are two contributions. So one is the, the bulk spin current and one, one is the edge spin current. And both of them decay exponentially or decay, uh, yeah, this decay exponentially as a function of system size. And this exponential decay is because of, this, of the Gilbert damping. Now what you also see is that the edge spin current is much, much smaller and decays much faster than the bulk spin current. And this is due to the fact that uh, the edge states are at higher energy. And then the decay rate in this Gilbert damping type uh, description, the decay rate is proportional to the energy of the states. And so that's why the decay rate of the edge states is much larger than the decay rate of the bulk states. However, this is in a clean system. If you now introduce defects, uh, so this, these three pictures are in the order of increasing uh, density of defects, then what you see is that um, the defects, they affect the bulk states much more violently than the edge states. So what you see is that the decay rate of the bulk states goes up. So this blue line, uh, so that's the bulk spin current, uh, so the decay length goes, uh, goes down. And at some point, for a sufficient large, uh, sort of for a sufficient number of defects, there is a critical length above which the uh, the bulk states actually contribute less to the spin current than the edge states. Okay, so there's this crossing point here. So what is the notion of symmetry here? So usually, when you talk about topological insulators, what matters is time reversal symmetry, lack of presence. So what does it actually mean? Um, Right, so the effective Hamiltonian that you engineer uh, by using this Hamiltonian corresponds to a, um, right, to a time reversal breaking uh, topological insulator. So you have to look at, look at the ordinary churn number for this case. So it's basically you, you get for the magnons, you get a uh, Haldane Hamiltonian. But then there you, it's hard to stop the chiral, you, know, you can't really stop a chiral edge state in a quantum pulse system. It must go on, right? So here you're saying there's still a decay of this? Uh, yeah, that's because there is, uh, because of this Gilbert damping. 
So the, the uh, basically there are, there are two things. The first thing is that uh, you don't occupy the states with a Fermi function. You occupy them with a Bose function. So you occupy both bulk and edge. Secondly, there is a relaxation of the states. And they also the relaxation also affects the uh, edge states more dominantly because they're at higher energy. So if I would, uh, or maybe that's, if I would take this picture and would switch off the Gilbert damping, then I would, I would get two flat lines, basically. Yeah? Does it answer your question? Or? Anyway, so, um, so the bulk states are more affected more strongly, and at some point for a sufficiently large system, I find that the edge state always dominates the spin current. So this basically means that you can define a crossover length scale above which the edge states dominate the spin current with respect to the bulk states. And here is this crossover length scale, L star, as a function of defect concentration. So these are numerical measurements, and these are, uh, this is a simple analytic estimate. Okay, so the take home message here is that uh, if you want to use these bosonic or uh, these, these magnal system, if you want to use these topologically protected edge states, uh, then for a sufficiently large system size, uh, they will actually dominate the spin transport. Uh, but it's not as simple as for uh, electronic systems. Um, then in, I think in view of the time, I will skip the magnetic insulator, mod insulator. And I'll switch now to a... Um, to the final topic, the last five minutes or so, and that's about magnetic black holes. Um, so, so let me introduce that topic. So, um, some of you may know that, uh, let's say, Hawking radiation is an extremely important concept in the, uh, let's say, in general relativity, of course. Um, so it's kind of very important because any, uh, let's say, any proper theory for quantum gravity, any proper candidate theory for quantum gravity um, would have to be able to predict black hole entropy, would, would have to be able to give a microscopic explanation of black hole entropy. And black hole entropy is strong, is very closely related to Hawking radiation. Now, um, so Hawking radiation being as important as it is, is extremely hard to observe uh, experimentally. And this motivated, uh, uh, in particular, Bill Unruh and other people to think of analog systems to, uh, uh, to observe uh, Hawking radiation. And I think one of the nicest pictures in this regard is this uh, uh, picture of fish near a waterfall. So what does it mean, a analog of a black hole or an analog of a black hole horizon? Um, so black ho an analog of a black hole horizon, in this case for fish, uh, would be a, let's say, a, um, uh, let's say a water flow that increases in speed. So here the water is flowing uh, less fast than uh, what is flowing here. And then at some point, uh, there's a point of no return. And once the fish gets past this point of no return, they're not able to swim upstream anymore uh, to go uh, to the safe part of this, uh, of this water flow. And so basically this point of no return is defined by a transition where the velocity of the flow transitions from being uh, subsonic, from being smaller than the velocity of the fish. Of course, this is assumed that the fish can only swim at one speed. I don't know if that's true for scared fish as well, but... Uh, <laughs> um, uh, so at some point, this, this velocity of the flow goes from subsonic being sm uh, smaller than the velocity of the fish uh, to uh, supersonic, being faster than the velocity of the fish. Now, this is a simple example of a black hole horizon analog for, uh, for fish. And you can do something similar with, uh, uh, with all kinds of waves that are, that are traveling on flowing media. So whenever you have water that is flowing and you study water waves on top of this flowing water, you can, in principle, think about similar analogs such as this, uh, this horizon for the fish. So this was proposed by Bill Unruh, uh, and I like to show this, uh, this, pic this, 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 this paper for two reasons. First of all, I think it's a very nice paper. Second of all, he writes things that uh, I've never been able to get away with uh, uh, when submitting something to uh, PRL. 
namely saying that it's kind of uh, it's probably undetectable, however much simpler than blah blah blah. Um, to be honest, I think well, okay, I've I've made this joke more often than once, but this statement is true for everything, I think. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I think, uh, yeah. Anyway, I can I can. So th this would be nice to to write in any arbitrary paper, right? But, uh, <laughs> So the question that we asked ourselves is, can we do something similar with magnons? And the answer is yes. Uh, and I will show you our, basically, our, our basic proposal. And then I'll, uh, I'll, that's, that's kind of the end of my, my talk. So we can do something similar with, with magnons if we use the following setup. Um, so these are, and this is a slightly different topic from the beginning of the talk. So th these are now actually magnons and magnetic metals. Um, and magnons and magnetic metals experience a Doppler shift due to uh, the current that's flowing. And this Doppler shift basically drags along magnons in the direction of current. So whenever I have a magnetic conductor, uh, such as in this setup, and I push through a current, then spin waves in one direction uh, will be dragged along with the current, and in the opposite direction they will be pushed back by the current, just in the same way as the fish near the waterfall were either swimming along or opposite to the current. Now, if you then take a, a, a wire of magnetic material and uh, just make uh, the wire from, let's say, wide to small and push a current through, uh, actually, the current goes from right to left, but the Doppler shift turns out to be opposite in sign to the current. So the background velocity that the magnons uh, feel is basically opposite to the current. So this velocity now goes from, let's say, subsonic in this region to supersonic in this region. So what now happens in this setup is that if I send in a magnon from the left, uh, once it has mass, m uh, passed this uh, magnonic black hole horizon, it can never ever make it back to the left again. Okay, so this particular setup for sufficiently large current turns out to create a black hole for magnons that I send in from the left, simply because here they can uh, still travel in both directions because uh, the, the drag of the electrons is uh, not big enough to overcome their velocity. However, once they've pushed in the, into this, this region here where the current is higher because the wire is, is becoming smaller, then uh, they, cannot, they can only move, let's say, downstream. So this particular simple setup uh, creates a magnonic black hole horizon. And if you then go through the numbers, uh, of course, it's a little bit more intricate than just this simple picture here. If you go through the numbers, uh, you'll find um, a Hawking temperature for this horizon, so this horizon will uh, uh, radiate magnons. And the Hawking temperature at which it does is given by this expression, so this is a well-known expression in, in, in the business of analog gravity. It turns out to do so at, at one Kelvin. So it's not an extremely high Hawking temperature in the context of uh, analog gravity, but it's also not a low temperature. For example, in the analog gravity systems, uh, based on, uh, on flowing Bose-Einstein condensates, this Hawking temperature will be much uh, lower. But there, of course, also the temperature of the, the setups are much lower. So these are typical Hawking temperatures that we, uh, that we expect for this system. But just closing off the talk, uh, so, uh, so this is what it looks like if you ask a cartoonist to make a nice picture of it. <laughs> uh, and this is what got me into the Dutch newspapers. Uh, but this is kind of the cartoon. We have spin waves interacting with uh, electrons, so that's these lightning rods, and then there's some black hole for this spin wave. Now I should point out is that all that we do in this analog system is simulate a black hole horizon for, uh, for spin waves, for magnons. We don't really have a singularity where the magnons uh, disappear. Um, so that, that this, this picture, of course, suggests there is such a singularity, but uh, okay, it's not really there. What is important, though, is that everything could, in principle, occur in a solid state setup on a chip. And that's one of the advantages of using this uh, type of uh, system to uh, study aspects of, of, of gravity. OK, just to give you an outlook. Um, so one of the nice things, I think, about, this, this, about implementing these magnonic black holes is not necessarily because it's an, another system to simulate, uh, to do analog gravity with, to simulate uh, black holes with. But just because it's a solid state system where you can do in principle something useful with these uh, magnonic black holes. 
So I think they also provide a nice way for manipulating spin waves and perhaps even using uh, um, the entangled Hawking pairs, so these, these, these magnons that are emitted from the horizon are entangled, uh, to use them for, uh, uh, for quantum information devices. Now, the outlook for the magnetic insulators that I talked about in the beginning, so one of the goals of this field is to uh, find a magnetic system where the magnons uh, that transmit the spin current are actually superfluid, are in a spin superfluid state, because this would lead to very long-range dissipationless uh, spin currents. So I think just to take home matches of this talk is uh, that spin currents are important, uh, and especially at the nanoscale. Um, and I hope to have convinced you that they lead to novel physics and some interesting uh, applications. And I hope that in a few years from now we can buy black holes uh, on a chip. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>